Good morning, Mountaintop Church family. Wherever you are this morning, we hope that you are doing well and that you are being safe and that you are that you will enjoy this day and rejoice in what God has in store for you today. So before we get started, I would encourage you to just stand up wherever you are and just like as if you were in the church this morning, you'd be standing up, getting ready to receive what God has for you today. As we begin to worship, I pray that you would just do so in a manner that just glorifies God. In the midst of everything that's going on around us, let's just pause and let God take over this moment, this time in fellowship with other believers around the world. You don't know, but we get people connected from different places throughout the states and throughout the countries. And just know that if you are in at home watching service by yourself, know that you're not alone. You are rejoicing with the church and honoring God by just putting him first this Sunday morning and at the beginning of this week. So let's pray and just give this time to God and just know that we are in God's presence and today is Pentecost Sunday. So let's act and just receive like God is gonna move in your heart, in your family and in your community today. So let's pray. Father God, I pray that you be with each individual, wherever they may be, Lord God. Let us calm our hearts, calm our minds, and just give it to you today, Lord God. Let us just open every part of us, Lord God, believing that, Lord God, you can change anything. There are circumstances, our hearts, Lord God, our situations, Lord God. I pray that, Lord God, someone who's been feeling so hurt or so lonely today, Lord, I pray that today, that this moment, Lord God, they sense your love, your grace, your provision, Lord, your healing around them, Lord God, throughout um, this land, Lord God, I pray that we continue to turn our hearts towards you. And as we seek you today, Lord God, as we just put you the focal point today, Lord God, I pray that revival would happen in the hearts and in the lives of many around us, Lord God, and that, Lord God, we see your hand at work, Lord God, like never before, Lord God. And let's rejoice in that, Lord God, believing that you are still on the throne. You are still healer. You are still God above every circumstance, every situation, Lord God. And let us do so in a manner that just honors and glorifies you above it all. And so in Jesus' name I pray, amen. So we hope that you would step out, step in, and just just be in the presence of God and just worship him like you were here today. So let's get started. Please. 
want to give back to you, Father, the worship that you deserve, Lord. I pray, God, that our hearts would be clean, God, that our hearts would be turned towards you this morning, Father God. With everything that's going on in this world, Lord, I pray, God, that we wouldn't lose our focus on you, Lord, that we wouldn't be paying attention to those things, Lord. God, that we would just turn our hearts, that we would just turn and run closer to you, Father. Lord, I pray for protection upon our families, Lord. I pray, Lord, and thank you, Father, for just protecting us and keeping us in good health, Lord. God, we just want to give you all the glory this morning, Father, for all that you've done and all that you're going to do, God. We just lift up your name this morning, Father, because you are worthy of all of our praise, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
attitude of worship. I pray that this morning would be a morning that God just ministers to you in such a powerful way. As we sang these songs, How Great Thou Art, and the grace song about how God's goodness towards us is everlasting. And I pray today that you would feel that where you are. I don't know where you are. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know the challenges you face or the mountains you face or Perhaps it's uh, like the psalmist says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Maybe you feel that you're walking through that valley. And today I pray that the grace of God would reach you and encourage you and strengthen you today. Hallelujah, Lord. We worship you today, God. We thank you for our time together. Lord God, as now we transition, lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name, hallelujah, amen, and amen. This uh, morning... Again, we want to say welcome to all of you. I'm Pastor Jackie Holgate, my wife Lenora, she's sitting just right over here. And uh, we are so excited that you're able to join us this morning. And you know what? Uh, I'm I'm really looking forward to what God has in store, not only today, but tomorrow on and into the future. And I hope you have that anticipation. You know, I think sometimes we give up, we get really discouraged, and then we just kind of throw in the towel. And we say, I forget about it. And I want to encourage you, don't do that. Don't ever do that. Because the God that called you is a God of hope. He's the God of love. He's the God of power. And I want to encourage you to keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And so this morning as we transition into a different form of worship, let me just read a scripture passage to you found in the book of Luke's Gospel, chapter 6. It says in verse number 20, um, excuse me, it's verse number 37. Luke's Gospel 637, and this is what the Bible says in the NIV, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. And then he says, forgive, and you will be forgiven. And verse number 38 says, give, and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaking together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use... It will be measured to you. Did you get that? See, when we read scripture, sometimes I think we just kind of rush through it and we don't really walk through the word of God. And today, as we read this, what he's talking about is in the context of forgiving others. And if people forgive you, you ought to forgive people. As a matter of fact, sometimes it has to start with you. Uh, Today, you might be... Uh, a person that offended someone or maybe you're a person that said something you shouldn't have said or done things you shouldn't have done and you know what? You know who you are because the Spirit of God convicts you and I want to encourage you in this context what he says is this what you do to people you know what? When they do it back to you don't be surprised. Matter of fact he takes that concept and this is what he says. He says give and it will be given. Give what? Whatever you give will be given back to you. Okay, so if you give, you know, finances, finances are coming your way. If you give a smile, someone's going to smile at you. If you're nice to people, someone will be nice to you. Okay, on the other side, if you're mean to people, people might be mean to you. All right, so it's the concept of what we refer to as the law of reciprocity. It goes forth and it comes back to us. And look what it says. A good measure 
pressed down, shaken together. Running over, or run, running over will be poured into your lap. See, so God is trying to teach us something through this stewardship concept is that whatever we give, we're going to get back. And however much we give, we will get that much back. As a matter of fact, with God's grace and goodness, he'll give us even more. How many of you know that what you don't deserve, you have through the grace of God? And look what he says. The same measure will be poured into your lap. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And so today, I want us to be reminded, all of us, myself included, that we need to be generous. We need to give without grudgingly, or the Bible says, without uh, uh, hanging on to it. You know, when you're born, somebody said, you come into this wor world with a clutch fist. When you're born, you're, you're crying and you're screaming. They hit you on the back and, ah, you're crying and you're, you're, your fist is clutch. And when you die, your hands are open. So what happened between birth and death, you've learned a lot. And one of the things I pray for you is that you learn generosity. That when you leave this earth, you're going to leave a mark behind. You're going to leave something behind. And you know what? What we leave behind, the greatest thing we can leave behind is investment in people. Investment in the kingdom of God. Investment to be generous to God. And when the gospel of Jesus Christ is advanced and preached around the world and you have something to do with it, you know what? Missionaries depend on this. Our finances. Ministry teams depend on this. The fact that this particular organization, I, I guess it's not necessarily an organization, but a living organism, the body of Christ, depends on it. And my heart goes out to you with this encouragement. Please understand today that God will give back what you have given. And if you give generously, you know what? He'll be generous to you. That's my prayer for you. Okay? With that, let's pray, and we'll give in the offertory. And uh, there's a couple ways to do that. Uh, one way to do that is just uh, go online, Mountaintop church az.org and there's a give button you can hit that and then hit on the tab and it'll drop a tab and the tab will tell you what are you giving offering ties you know benevolence or whatever it is maybe i think there's a building funds in there and then uh some other different mission mission, uh, mission auxiliaries and then also uh there's the project hope is in there too if you want to give towards project hope and so i want to encourage you please let's be generous you can give online or you could send it in there's a mailing list uh uh, on, on the website as well. And then you could even come by and just drop it off. Or there'll be some people out there serving you and ready to help you. And so let's be faithful to God. Amen? Be faithful to God. Because what we give, we're going to get back. And let me tell you something. It's, you cannot ever outgive God. We will never outgive God. Amen. And so with that, let's pray. Father, bless both the gift the giver. Bless our heart. Bless our mind. Bless our family. Father God, as you bless us, let's always remember where it came from. Lord, it didn't come from us, God. It didn't come from perhaps even our employer. Really, you gave us that job. You gave us favor to have that work. Matter of fact, you not only gave us that job, you gave us our health so that we can live and breathe and have a healthy being so that we can go to work. Matter of fact, you've given us our resources. And today, God, let's be very responsible to be good stewards, to give back what belongs to you. 10% of everything we make is called a tithe. That 10% really indicates the 90% of the finances you've given us. How we handle the 10% is how you will bless us in the 90%. And Father God, I just pray that you would teach us, guide us, direct us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you as you give. We're going to sing another song together. Let's bless the Lord. Why don't you stand with me? Uh, you might be getting too comfortable in your lazy boy. And to get out of, out of your lazy boy, let's bless the Lord together this morning, okay? Let's praise the Lord. Amen.
together and worship together. I hope that you were blessed this morning. I hope you felt the presence of God. You know why? Because that's what we prayed before service. We got together and we just had a prayer that God would just reach through those cameras and whatever medium you're using, that God would minister to you. And I know that everyone that's watching is being ministered to. We're praying for you. We pray that God would just bless you today with strength, wisdom, whatever you need that God will come through for you today. Amen. We love you. We appreciate you. Uh, my wife and I, Lenora, we've been pastoring this church for 13 years here at Mountaintop, and we're just so blessed to have you as part of our body, and especially our Mountaintop church folks. Uh, and then there are other people that are logging on week after week and on Wednesday nights too, and there are people that are talking with me uh, just through, through Messenger and through even Facebook and just saying, hey, Pastor, we just love uh, what God's doing at your church and what God's doing through your church. And I want to say thank you for tuning in. God bless you. Thank you guys for leading us out today. Uh, we're going to go ahead and switch gears again. And in that, we're going to go ahead and give our announcements today. Uh, these are our announcements for the week. And as uh, I'll kind of elaborate a little bit on it right before I preach today, some of the things that are on the announcements. And so uh, just again, God bless you. Thank you for joining us. And welcome to Mountaintop uh, Church. Uh, uh, I guess I would, I don't know what to call it, I guess um, uh, online ministry, and so I never thought we would be online like this, but you know what, hey, there's things that happens, we adjust, and then when we adjust, sometimes God multiplies it, and I think that's what God did in this situation, and to Him be the glory, amen. God bless you as we listen to this announcement. Go ahead, guys. Well, hey there, Mountaintop Church. My name is Angie. We hope that you are enjoying our online service so far. Before we continue our service, there are a few announcements for this coming week you do not want to miss out on. Thank you for supporting Mountaintop Project Hope. We had a successful outreach this past week to our Central Western Agency area. 
Our next outreach will be taking place tomorrow. If you would like to continue to partner with us, please visit our website for more detail. Our leadership team has decided to start meeting as a body next Sunday on June 7th at 10 a.m. Pastor Holgate will be giving directions starting today, so please be on a lookout for that information. For the latest detail regarding our church, you can check the church website or you can follow us on Facebook or Instagram page. We want to encourage you to log on to all of our services on Facebook Live or YouTube. Please invite someone to join with you. There are three ways that you can continue to give your tithes and your offering. First, you can visit our website and select the Give Now button. Second, you can stop by our church on Sunday from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. and someone will be outside to collect your offering. Third, you can mail in your offering to Mountain Top Church. Thank you for your faithfulness. We hope that you will be blessed, challenged, and changed by today's service, and we hope to see you next week. Have a wonderful week. Uh, that, those are our announcements, and again, we just want to encourage all of you to log on to our website for some information coming forth for our announcements, and uh, if you're a church member at Mountain Top Church, you can always call us. You can call myself or some of our team members, uh, Pastor Lynette or my wife, and maybe even some of the other people that's part of our leadership, okay? So thank you so much for uh, just uh, you know having patience and uh, going through this together. Amen. Well, I just need to make three other announcements, okay? And it's not going to be very long, but the first one is this. I want to say congratulations to all the graduates, all the way from Head Start to preschool to uh, eighth grade promotion, high school graduation, those that are graduating from a higher education, from the universities, from the colleges. We want to say congratulations to all of you. God bless you. Typically what we do in our church is those that graduate from high school and those that graduate from college, we give them a Bible and just pray over them and let them know that we are so proud of them. And I'm sure your folks, your family are proud of you as well. And uh, we just want to say congratulations to all of you. So you deserve a pat on the back today for being uh, committed to your school and your education. And please continue on. Continue to learn if you need to go to college, go to some kind of uh, maybe a technical school or whatever you need to do, stick with it, complete it, and use it to support yourself, your family, and even your tribe. Amen. So number two, uh, next week. Somebody say next week. Next week, okay? And on the other side of the camera, I'll say next week to your neighbor, okay? Next week, we're going to be resuming our in-person services. So we'll be coming back together. I'm not sure exactly what that's going to look like, but you know what? We're going to work on that this coming week. Matter of fact, uh, starting tomorrow and Tuesday, I'll be, we'll be posting something on our website. We'll be posting something on social media to give direction as to what we're going to do. So next week, we'll be coming back together and I'm not sure exactly how many people we can fit in here with uh, some distancing and wearing masks and that whole thing. And so we'll give some instruction in regards to that. So next week we will be starting in services again. And for the time being, um, we will be just doing one service. It's going to be at 10 o'clock. And then as we begin to progress forward, uh, most likely we'll split our services again. At 9 and 11, which we typically do before COVID-19 took place, uh, we were having two services, and both services are typically uh, pretty full, and so we just want you to know next week, and uh, if you could just come a little early to get a seat, uh, so I apologize even today, okay, for those that will be turned away because we're to capacity, and so just don't get hurt over that, okay, don't go to church and get hurt and be mad the rest of the year. Okay, don't do that. So I'm warning you. I don't know if you need to call our church. Uh, talk to one of us to reserve seating. Maybe we'll go that direction, but we'll be giving direction starting tomorrow and Tuesday. So be, look, be on the lookout for that. And then also today, I just want, before I preach, pray for those that are sick. 
Uh, if you're uh, going through some really trying times and you've been affected by this COVID-19, and I know there are some people in our body that are going through that, and I want to pray for you right now. I want to pray for those that have been isolated for too long and those that are feeling somewhat uh, uh, just, uh, just a heaviness upon them and maybe even depression, you're, de- you're battling depression, and it seems like the clouds just over your head all day, every day for the last couple days or the last couple weeks, I want to pray for you today, and we want to pray together. So if you could, let's just join hands wherever you might be, and I just want to pray with you today and lead you in this prayer. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you again today. We know that you have a plan. We know that you have a purpose. We know, God, that your plan and your purpose is for, not, for us not to be living in depression, for us not to be living in a place of vulnerability, of questioning you, the, the Lord, the time that we live in, questioning ourselves, and even questioning the existence that we have. Because we know that life is sacred, God. All of us are created by you. We belong to you. And Lord, there's a design that you've put us into, God. There's a purpose and a plan, God, that there's also a provision in that. And Father God, may we fight the good fight of faith against depression, against loneliness, against God. Just every imaginable things that the enemy throw at us. The world threw at us, and even some of our friends and family members threw at us, God. Or maybe there are those that we do life with, they, they're just negative, and they're always talking down on us, and they're saying stuff they shouldn't say to hurt us and to try to damage us today. Lord, we come against that in the name of Jesus. And Father God, especially I pray for those that are affected by this virus called coronavirus, God. We come against that in the name of Jesus. We take authority over it right now in Jesus' name. By the precious blood that was shed for us, may you cover them, may you heal them, may you deliver them. And Father God, we know that you are faithful. Father God, your word says your name is Jehovah Rapha, the God he that healeth us. The God, he that delivers us, that word, Rapha, in the original text means the God that stitches, the God that mends, the womb that was put there because of, Lord, uh, of of, of, uh, outside force that tries to destroy us. I pray that the minds of your people would be strong and alert in God, that they will transform their mind by the reading of God's word. And Father God, today I pray your healing right now. I feel your anointing in this room, God. Minister to people out there, Jesus. Those that are sick with other uh, uh, sickness, God. Maybe there are those that are just having migraines. Maybe there are those that are having back aches. And Lord God, maybe a heart issue. Lord God, maybe whatever, whatever it is that ails them in the name of Jesus, I pray your healing. Lord, touch them today. May they touch the hem of your garment And may they be healed, God. May virtue flow out of your body, Jesus, and into their body so that they can be healed. And Father God, I pray for peace. I pray for strength, comfort, and I pray, Lord God, they will stand up right now and give you praise. They will worship you right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you that we can pray together like this. And God, you're not limited by, Lord, time and space. Father, wherever we might be, or we might be watching this a year later or a couple months down the road, and we need a touch and a healing. Lord, you even surpass all those timelines, God. This can be viewed like two weeks down the road as somebody needs healing and you can still heal them. Even though the prayer has already been prayed weeks ago, months ago, years ago, Lord, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't keep you in, in confinement, God, but God, you, Lord God, just pass through those timelines, pass through those barriers, and minister to people. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. Praise God. God bless you. Thank you for praying with us, and it's such a joy to be able to do that. And those of our announcements and just our time together, and as we pray together today, amen. Well, this morning, let's go ahead and get into the Word of God. And today, I want to talk to you about something I felt the Lord begin to speak to me a couple days ago. And as God was speaking to my heart, I was listening, and I felt the Lord was saying in this time and in this day, And the times that we're living, there are many people that are being cut off. 
I don't know if you can say that with me today, but cut off. I don't know, have you ever felt cut off? Have you ever felt like all of a sudden you were going down the road and everything just kind of gets cut off and, and there's no more going, there's no more doing because something happened. And so one of the hardest things that can happen to you is to get cut off. And so today I want to talk to you about that. And I don't know if some of you begin to realize and you have a check in your spirit as I begin to talk about being cut off. Anyone ever lose reception on your phone, right? You're driving down the road and you're talking on the phone and all of a sudden it goes dead. You're cut off, right? And so have you ever experienced a power outage? You know, the lights are on, and you're watching TV, and, uh, you know, things are happening. All of a sudden, everything just comes to a stop, and the TV goes off, and, and the lights go off, and it's just dark. You're sitting there, and the power is cut off. Have you ever run out of resources? Have you ever been without all that you need? You've been cut off. You got cut off. Anyone ever get cut off by crazy drivers in Flagstaff, Arizona? They just kind of cut in front of you, and you're driving along the way, and all of a sudden, anger rises up inside of you. You see, I believe the enemy's work is to cut things out from out of our lives. He wants to cut you off. He wants to cut off the blessings. He wants to cut off the communication with God. And so, or you're talking on the phone and you get cut off. And then there's a silence on the other end. You're talking to yourself. And so that's what I want to talk to you about. So let's go to Psalms chapter 31. Psalms, verse 22. The psalmist David, he's talking about some trying times in his life. And then this is what he says. He says, I, in, in my alarm, he says, I said, I am cut off from your sight. David, in the show, get. De yobik et sides gis nida. Do hats eat ego shitho. All of a sudden, there was this alarm in my life, and you know, the red flags went up, and the light started blaring, and there was an alarm that took place in my life, and he says, I realized in that moment, I am cut off from your sight. Yet you heard my cry for mercy. I desired love. I desired grace and mercy. He says that, yet you heard my cry for mercy when I called to you for help. The psalmist says, I cried out to you, and in my alarm, I knew I was cut off, and I knew the, the, the vision and the oversight of God in my life was gone. I sensed that in my life. But when I cried to you in mercy, you came to help me. You see, God never leaves us hanging. Last week, we talked about complaining, right? We talked about how the children of Israel were cut off from their destiny or their destination, and there was a Red Sea in front of them, mountains on both sides, the enemy breathing down their necks, and they were cut off, and they started complaining. They started panicking, and in the same tone, this word alarm comes to us. When you panic, all of a sudden there's no power, all of a sudden there's no connection. You're not connected to life. The power of God's been cut off in your life. Your prayer life is cut off. So your word life is cut off. And so there might be people today out there that's feeling that way. 
You feel like you've been cut off and there's no more power. There's no more activity. And today I want to encourage you with these words. See, so let's go to the book of Acts chapter number 8. Acts, and the verse we're going to read is from verse number 26 and it's going to be quite a few verses all the way down to verse number 39. And so read with me and I'll just kind of summarize it in Navajo. Now the angel of the Lord said to Philip. Now Philip was one of the uh, disciples of Jesus. Philip, hey Jesus, Jesus, he was an evangelist. And so an angel of the Lord comes to this name, this guy by the name of Philip, and this is what the angel said to him. Go south to the road. So it was very specific, the desert road. Kind of like between here and there, between here and, you know, wherever you might be on the reservation. It's this desert road. And so the angel of the Lord comes to him and says, go on this desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Did Gaza go at Kiniki? Jerusalem, so he started out out of the Yanila, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch. Ethiopian Nzinga, who was uh, really he was on the uh, <coughs> northern part of Sudan or Africa. This eunuch was a, a servant to a queen. This man was fixed to where he can't bear children, and so he's a eunuch. And so this man was very important, official in charge of all the treasury of, uh, of Candace, uh, the queen of Eth- Ethiopian. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. Jerusalem He went as uh, to practice Judaism is what he went to Jerusalem for. And look at this. And on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. Isaiah han the son of get there ba han eki was ka ki yos ka ko bis o nes ni la sho get the spirit told Philip I don't think you need Philip which had see go to that chariot and stay near it di that's not possible si ka si ki beneath the na I don't be ka ki when you don't but don't need I don't hold on that sho get then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah the prophet Philip asked the question, do you understand what you are reading? How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me? And so the eunuch says, I don't understand what I'm reading. How can I understand this unless someone enlightens me, unless someone educates me? So, so he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Out of Philip, as uh, this is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was like a sheep to the slaughter. They let him and they forced him to speaking about Jesus. And as a lamb before its shearer was silent. So Isaiah is talking prophetically about Jesus the Messiah to come. That he would be slaughtered and that he would be uh, lied about and that whole thing. So he did not open his mouth. Jesus didn't open his mouth to defend himself when he was crucified. Jesus at Kelyago, yeah. I do not answer the In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. I do justice. Justice is when the right thing happens in any given situation. 
You see, right now in our world, over in Minneapolis, there was a black man that was killed by a police officer that was supposed to protect and serve him, but he was killed, and there's an uprising taking place all across America. People are upset as they watch their, uh, the video or the taping of a person being held down as the knee was on, on, on the neck of this individual who was already in handcuff, and there were four people that were there that were supposed to protect him. They did not bring justice to this man, but they killed him, and as a result, the nation is in an uproar. And so look what it says. This man who was led like sheep, to, to the slaughter, he had no justice. It was deprived of him. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. Jesus says, yeah, because of you and me, we are the one that put Jesus on the cross. We are the one that killed him because of our sin. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? And so this man, the eunuch, is now asking questions. Is the prophet talking about himself or is he talking about someone else? And look at this. Verse 35, then Philip began with the very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. You see, he was reading Isaiah 53, where he gives it a quote. As they travel along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch, and the eunuch, get cut off. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. And as they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand... Okay, there we go. My bad. Okay, here we go. As they travel along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of me, of, of, in the way of my being baptized? He asks a question about being baptized in water. And let's continue to verse number 38. And look what it says. Okay, my bad. Let me just read it out to you from my Bible. Verse number 38 says, And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized them. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. And so here is the situation. Philip, <laughs> The angel of the Lord sends him, and as he sends him, this is what happens. He meets this eunuch on the way home from Jerusalem. Jerusalem, that's not all. Okay, Jerusalem, that's not all. Isaiah, he revealed to him what was written in the book of Isaiah and what it what. He explained the scriptures to him, basically. And so we read the story, and the eunuch has conviction. He came to a place of understanding the word of God. And he looked at himself, and he probably said something to this effect, that he was a sinner. Jesus I'm the one that killed Jesus. I'm the one that put him on the cross. That's probably what he thought. And so the Spirit of God convicted him, and as a result, he prayed a prayer of faith. He was delivered, he was saved, and he said, Stop the chariot, there's water, what can keep me from me being baptized? According to the word of God, according to the apostles' teaching. 
Ben dat no tchiniki pe da ose ni go ni etzado yistrahi aj dot kobelzi. Philip went and baptized this Ethiopian eunuch. He comes out of the water and in that moment God took Philip to another place. But the eunuch got back into his chariot and on his way he rejoiced because of his salvation. And so the story of the Ethiopian eunuch was just that he went to Jerusalem to worship. He was a worshiper. His desire was to honor God and to worship God. And so he goes to Jerusalem and many will tell you he probably wanted to try out Judaism. Jew benantkini. Moses mabehez ani bikita teshkint. Nziko shatlana nziko niya. He came all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem. It's a great distance. It's a great ways away from his hometown. And he worshiped and now he's returning. And not only is he a person that came from a long ways, but he was also a person of importance. So Diego, chipped the auto bear with the Zenhada Queen Candace Bear, which is an Ethiopian queen. He served the queen as the treasurer. So he handled all the money, he took care of all the finance of the, of, of the queen's kingdom, and so he was a very knowledgeable, educated person. Diego, Ishka. He knew investments. He knew all these things. And so, so now he's returning home. He didn't lack anything in the natural. There was so much that he had. But this is the deal, church. Check this out. He was a eunuch. You know, sometimes you do that to animals, right? We, we, we castrate them. And so they can't reproduce. And so if you look at the law of Moses, Moses, these individuals that were units were not allowed beyond a certain point in the temple. There was these people they had, the, the men in here, the women out here, the Gentiles over here, and then the eunuchs, they had a separate place. Because they were eunuchs, they can't bear children, and so they were, they were really, a so, this was a, a, a social injustice that was happening to them. And so he's over here relegated from the furthest from the temple or in the temple, from the place of worship. He worshiped over here with the eunuchs. And so now he's coming home. So basically, what am I saying about him? He was cut off in the natural, in the spiritual, in the social, in every area of life. This person was cut off. He was cut off. You see, he had a lot of similarities with leprosies. Those that were those that had lepers, those that had leprosies that were referred to as lepers, they were people when they received the skin and, and uh, disease upon them. When they started having the spots on their face or on their hands and leprosy begins to eat them, they were taken into a separate colony and they were cut off. They had to wear bells around their neck. When they're walking down the road, when they met people, they had to cry from a distance and say, unclean, unclean, unclean. So people would go around them. And so they were cut off from their family. They were cut off from society. They were cut off from any, any civil um, activity, any going to ball games or going to, you know, the flea market or going to the market, going to stores. They were cut off from all of that. They live at the mercy of elements. They live by themselves and people that love them would bring food to them and they would just leave it somewhere for them so they can come out after they had left. And so they were cut off. And so this eunuch had a lot of similarities in lifestyle and outlook and perspective as the lepers. And maybe today you're here and you say, Pastor, sometimes I feel that way. 
Sometimes I feel I'm cut off. I'm cut off from just knowing God all together. I'm cut off from having fellowship with brothers and sisters. Or I'm estranged from my family. My family cut me off. My mom, my dad, they turned their backs on me. And I feel like a leper. I feel like a, a eunuch. I'm cut off. I can't reproduce. In Bible times, this would equate to being in sin. If someone had lepers like Naaman, remember Naaman? The Syrian, he was a chief and commander for the Syrian army. Remember he had leper and the Bible says that because of his leprosy, he could not command, he could not lead. And so he goes to the prophet Elijah and Elijah says, why don't you go down to this river and dip in it seven times? And he went into the water and dipped in it seven times. He comes out and his leprosy was healed. He was delivered. He was healed of his lepers because the leprosy cut him off and he the leprosy basically terminated everything you had. Your job, your status, your family, your relationship, it was all cut off. And for this eunuch, it was the same scenario. Because it equates with sin. Can I say something about sin to you? Sin separates us from God. Sin cuts us off. Sin will cut off the power source, the power line to God. Access to God is denied. Total separation occurs. In our notes, number one, his physical limitation kept him out. This particular eunuch by the name, uh, this, uh, his name is the Ethiopian eunuch. The, he, we don't even get his name. He's just being called a eunuch. He's just being called. He can't bear fruit. He's just being called. You can't be a father. You can't have children. You'll never experience the joy of being a grandparent. Is what he's being called. A eunuch. And so his physical limitation kept him out. No access. To be cut off means you have zero access into the inner courts of the temple in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, you can't go into the Holy of Holies, you eunuch, is what he's being told. And so no connection, no power in his life to communicate with God. No voice to be heard from him and the presence of God. No satisfying fulfillment in his life. Spiritually unproductive as the evidence shows physically he's unproductive. He was forbidden to come in. You know what the Bible says in Romans chapter 3? It says that all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. If we compare ourselves to this man by the, by the name of the Ethiopian eunuch, we are in the same category as he. We are in the same place as he is before Jesus, before grace, before the love of God. We have no access. Access has been denied because of sin. We come short of the glory of God. You were not on the list of invitation. Have you ever been... Uh, been to a party and they told you you can't go in this was the person see that was you and me you see there was a physical limitation to keep us out because of the fact that he's a eunuch no understanding 
He had no understanding as a result. He did not have the full understanding of God's word. Number one reason he cannot understand God's word is he cannot go into the inner place of worship, into the place where the priest is reading the word of God, where the priest is reading out of Ezra or out of Nehemiah as they're worshiping God. He was unable to hear it because he is God barriers in front of him and he's way over there in the corner and he can't hear so he did not understand perhaps he was unable to ask question due to the separation in the temple there were obvious barriers and that muffled the communication understanding it at we just don't read God's word for the sake of reading. We read it so that God can speak to us. We read it so that he can correct us. We read it so he can rebuke us. We read it so that he can lead us and guide us and teach us. And yet in this man's life, that was absent. It couldn't happen. Was it because he got religion? Rules of do's and don'ts. Most likely it was an empty ritual of man-made practices. He just comes to Jerusalem from a long distance. He, can't, he doesn't even go to the inner courts of the temple. He's just sitting out there thinking maybe somehow God can reach him. He's watching and listening, trying to eavesdrop to what's being carried on on the inner side of the temple cords, and he has no communication because physically he's hindered. No understanding means no revelation of the mysteries of God. God You know what Paul said about Moses? Moses went to the mountain and God spoke to him. He comes off the mountain. We couldn't even look at him. Moses his face was glowing. And so what did he say? We took veils and we covered our faces. Kind of like you covering your mouth and your nose because of the COVID-19. And he said, this is what we did. We covered our faces. Because if we took the veil away, us looking at Moses would have killed us. In his Moses it would have killed us is what he said but look what he says but Jesus came and he took the veil he took the barrier and he removed it now what can we do now we can look and we can see for ourselves we can have revelation no understanding means no revelation of the mysteries of God, just like Nicodemus and John chapter 3, Nicodemus, Jesus, he came under the covering of darkness. He came to Jesus and he says, Jesus, I have a question for you. I want to ask you a question. And Jesus says, what's your question? And what did he say? He says, how can a man enter the kingdom of God? How can a man enter into heaven? And Jesus looked at Nicodemus and said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And Nicodemus scratched his head. He was this old dude who was about 78 years old. He's on the Sanhedrin council. He is a scribe. He is a very educated person. He's got a lot of wisdom, but he can't reach God. So he asks the question, how do I get there, Jesus? Master, how can I get to God? And Jesus says, you must be born again. And Nicodemus says this, look, do I go back into my mother's womb a second time? What do you mean be born again? 
And look what Jesus says. They that are born of the flesh is flesh. They that are born of the spirit is spirit. And look what Jesus says. And you must be born of the spirit and of water. Many theologians will tell you that word water is the word of God. Ephesians 5, I believe it's 25, that says that the water is the washing of God's word. You see, without water, you can't live. You have to drink water, you have to wash with water, you have to cook with water. Everything you do, you do with water. It cleanses, it purifies. The word of God is like water. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless you're born of the spirit and of water, you cannot see God. So the You must be born again. And look, Nicodemus gave his life, his life to Jesus. He put his trust in Jesus. Jesus, your son. What happens when we do that? Spiritually, we become born again. So we came out of the womb of our mother in the natural. But we were born into sin. And because of sin, we've been cut off from God. We've been severed ties this way and that way. When we were in the world, we were worldly. We sinned, we lied, we cheated, we did everything in the book. Things that are not admirable. Things that we're ashamed of. We did when we were in the world. But now we've been born again. You know what we do? We change. Now we trust God. Now we pray to God. Now we read his word. As much as we can understand, as much as we can learn of God's word, now we're growing in our understanding. Nicodemus didn't understand. And Jesus explained to him. Now he understands. Maybe you don't know why you are the way you are. Maybe you feel empty, you feel vain, you feel dry in your heart and in your spirit. And you're cut off. You're struggling. You're trying to understand. You give up too easy. I'll just sin some more. I'll just do stuff that I'm not supposed to do some more. I'll lie some more. I'll cheat some more. I'll do the things of the world. And you're being lied to. And you just, all these things consumes you. Because you're cut off. You don't have any revelation. And today the word of God is being preached to you. My desire is that the light would turn on. My desire is that you will see Jesus for who he is, why you put him on the cross, why he died for you, and that you would cry out to him. You see, his physical limitation kept him out. So there was no access, there was no understanding, and number three, no justice. There was no justice for this Ethiopian eunuch. He didn't receive justice from God. He might have received sympathy and applause and people committing to him for coming a long ways. But you know, in the end, there was no justification in his life. Something is wrong when you have difficulty understanding the situation. He was a hungry soul looking for fulfillment in life. His soul is struggling. His spirit is dying inside of him. And there's no justice given to him. And so he's seeking and searching and he comes to Jerusalem. No justice means he was 
at a disadvantage. It was not fair for him to be where he was at the time. Even though he traveled to Jerusalem. Now he's going home empty and vain. Can I tell you something? Religion will never satisfy you. Oh, church, go na atta. Oh, oh, what the ingo so what I mean, you can do whatever religion you want to do. Religion is man trying to get to God. It's impossible. Do be gata do bohone sound. Religion hat ni go banda alte. You see, this church here, Mountaintop Church, we're, we're considered by the government and other people outside. We're considered as a religious organization, but it's not about religion. In this church, it's about relationship. A relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, there's peace between us and Jesus. We have confessed our sin. We apologize for our sin. We recognize our sin. We recognize we're helpless and hopeless and powerless without God. God, We can't see. We grow up in darkness without the light coming on. And so we cry out to God. What did the psalmist say? I was alarmed because I was cut off. The eyes of the Lord was not upon me because of my sin. He cried to God. Matter of fact, in another place is what he says. I cried to the Lord and he heard my cry. He inclined unto me. He took me out of a horrible pit, out of a miry clay. He set my feet upon the rock. He established my going. He put a song of praise in my mouth and a song of worship in my heart. A new song, he says. Can I tell you today, God can give you a new song if you let him, if you confess your sin, if you swallow your pride. You swallow your arrogance, you're puffed up, you think you're bad and all of that. But let me tell you something. None of us are bad enough to, 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 for God to, to, to be amazed at us. You see, God is bigger than all of us. God is bigger than the universe. God is bigger than every problem we ever face. God is greater than the ocean. God is greater than the air. God made all of that. We are nothing. Without God. No God, no universe. No God, no air. No God, no water. No God, no sustenance. No God, no raw material. No God, no earth. No God, no sun, no moon. No star. There's no universe without God. There's a God that is greater than all of this. And when we as sinners cry out to him, when we humble ourselves, we're cut off like this eunuch. We're cut off like Nicodemus. We're cut off like many in God's word. He's going to look at us with his grace. He's going to look at us with his love. This is why Jesus came to this earth. Look at this. Read it with me. In God's word, this individual was reading the Bible. He had no clue. He says, who is he talking about? Is he talking about himself or someone else? You see, to be cut off can lead you down the road of not having a voice, no purpose, no power to do what you are called to do in life. God designed you with a purpose and a reason to live. Physical limitation will keep us at a distance, separation from everyone that matters in life, especially God. This man was physically cut off. He was labeled. There was a stamp on his forehead that says no access, no communication, and no justice. Second of all, look at this. 
His physical limitation did not stop him from searching. His physical limitation, even though he was a eunuch, even though he was labeled, even though he was cut off, even though he was relegated to a certain place away from the temple worship, there were different rituals that happened inside the Holy of Holies. He was still searching. Why? Because there was a hunger inside of him. He is on his way home and still reading the scriptures. How many of you can do that today? How many of you during the week open the word of God and read it? How many of you during the day on your break or at your lunchtime, you open up your device and instead of spending 59 minutes on social media, you give God some time and read the Bible. See, what I do for me personally is this. Many times in the middle of the night, I get up and I start reading God's word. Many times I just pause, like I'm in the middle of my busyness, I'll just pause and take a couple minutes and even if it's a couple minutes, it's okay. Read God's word. And say, God, now I read this. Now, what are you saying to me? The rest of the day, I'm thinking about it. You see, this man, even though he was going home, he was still reading scriptures. How many of us are hungry enough to seek for the truth? To investigate all the facts of life in God's word. You see, the word of God tells us that we ought to read God's word. Dig deeper into God's word. Spiritual meanings are very important to all of us. Some of us, what we do is physically, we want to be comfortable. Physically, we want to eat. Physically, we want to groom. Physically, we want to shower. We want to take care of our physical being and we neglect our spiritual being. We eat, we, we, we wash, we, we buy clothes, we buy makeup, we buy all kinds of stuff. We spend hours doing all these things. What about spiritually? See, this man who was an, a eunuch, an Ethiopian, on his way home is reading probably something he bought in Jerusalem. A manuscript of God's word. So he's digging through it. He's reading as fast as he can. He wants to know more. You see, some of you today need to dig deeper in God's word. For yourself. Don't just depend on the pastor. Don't just depend on your mom and dad. You will not enter into the kingdom of heaven by the coattail of your pastor. You need to read God's word for yourself. You need to study the word of God. There are so many mediums out there you can use. There's a thing called right now media. If you don't have that, let me know. I'll send you an invitation. There are, there are Bible teaching. There is kind of like Netflix of Christian life. And there's so much teaching of God's word in it. You need to read it. You need to be like this eunuch who was desperate to learn more. In this look, he was accompanied by Philip the evangelist to help him. There was an evangelist, the revival was breaking out in Jerusalem. And God takes this evangelist and sends him to Samaria. He's in Samaria and now he's making his way back. On his way back, he goes to the desert of Gaza. And there the Ethiopian unit was traveling in his caravan. And the angel of the Lord says to Philip, Philip, go near that chariot. Stay near it. So Philip obeys the voice of the angel. He stands near the chariot as the chariot is going and he overhears him reading out of Isaiah. And then he approaches the chariot. He asks the eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch, he says, do you know what you're reading? And the eunuch responds, how can I know unless I have a teacher? 
Unless I have someone to enlighten me. Unless I have someone to help me. You know what that's called? It's called discipleship. It's called you belonging to a local church. If you don't have a local church, my encouragement to you is this. Find a local church that preaches and believes in God's word. If you are out there and just kind of a renegade Christian doing your own thing, you will never grow. God will never bless you. My encouragement to you is this. Find a local church. And in that local church, you will be taught God's word. In that local church, someone will speak into your life. There might be a pastor that will speak into your life. You see, every one of us, we need pastors. The overseer of our souls. He feeds us the word of God day in and day out, week in and week out, month in and month out, year by year, decade by decade, we grow in our faith. See, I'm privileged to be a product of a pastor in a place called Navajo Mountain. There was a family that came into our community and they shepherded the community. They pastored the community, those that were willing to come. And I was one of them that was willing to come. And I was one of them that got baptized when I was young into that baptistry. And I came out of that water. I experienced the same thing this eunuch experienced. And I grew in my faith. It was a place of worship. A place I learned. Oh, I learned to study the word of God. I learned what it means to serve God in a local church. I mean, to this day, I'm still learning. I haven't arrived. None of us will arrive until God calls us home. Look at this. He was changed by the simple message of the gospel. Jesus Christ. And him crucified. Jesus. He was like a sheep led to the slaughter. He was like a lamb that was going to be sheared. Did not retaliate. Jesus went to the cross. He stretched out his arms. And they nailed him. They put a crown of thorn on his brow. Oh, Jesus hung, suspended between heaven and earth, in nakedness without shame. He was not ashamed because he was dying in your place. He was dying in my place. Jesus, not that. Jesus says, Jesus, yet see, Jesus, he, the Bible says, was flogged and beaten. He pulled out his beard. They blindfolded him and smacked him, spat on his face, and they say, prophesy, who hit you? The weird thing about that whole story is this. Jesus knew exactly who hit him. Jesus knew the very person that was conceived in their mother's womb some days, years before. He knew them because he's the one that created them in the image of God. Jesus is the one is that's the creator of all things. The Bible says he came to his own, but his own received him not. As a matter of fact, his own killed him. The Jews rejected Jesus and to this day that's still going on it's not only the Jews but the Gentiles if you're a Gentile it's someone that's not a Jew the rest of us were Gentiles we rejected Jesus there was a barrier between us and God and Jesus took the place that we're supposed to die we're supposed to be punished we were supposed to be sentenced to judge to ju- by judgment of God, by the wrath of God, away from him. But Jesus built the bridge from judgment back to God. You see, that's why this man is hungry and searching. And he hears the simple message of the gospel. 
The message is very simple but yet powerful. This message compelled Paul to preach to many and he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is power unto salvation to those that believe first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. Haina Paul, Romans, Jesus Christ this message this gospel will dispel darkness it will dispel sickness it will dispel everything that brings fear to us Jesus is done his Jesus saved us Jesus delivered us through the message of the gospel. His physical limitation did not stop him from searching. You see, let's go to Isaiah 56 and verse 3. Look what it says in Isaiah 56. This is after Isaiah 53. I believe what Philip did was this. He read Isaiah 53, Isaiah 54... Isaiah 55 and then Isaiah 56. And look what it says. It says this, look. Let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me or reject me from his people. And let no unit complain. This is powerful. Let no unit complain. I am only a dry tree. In other words, the tree can't bear fruit. Look what God's saying to the prophet Isaiah and he's encouraging the Gentiles, he's encouraging the eunuchs to say these things. Don't let, don't, don't let them say this. Look what it says. For this is what the Lord says to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who chooses what pleases me and holds fast to my covenant. To them I will give within my temple and its walls. A memorial, a name better than sons and daughters. What's happening? God is elevating the Gentiles. God is elevating the units. So what's God doing? He's breaking down barriers. He's ba- breaking down social uh, statistics, uh, uh, statistics and across the board, all the demographics. We put people in categories. God is destroying the walls. And look at this. Even better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. The foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants. All who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and all who hold fast to my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, God says, for my, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Isn't that awesome? Look what it says. The sovereign Lord declares, he who gathers the exile of Israel, I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. What is God saying? God is saying, I will do this. And I will bring them back from every area. I will break down barriers. I will break down walls to those that will honor me, to those that will serve me. You see, Philip, I think, was doing this. He shared the gospel with the eunuch, and then he elaborates on it, and he says, don't ever call yourself a tree that is dry. Don't ever call yourself a unit that is distant, but you are better than a son and daughter. You are invited into the temple. You are invited beyond the walls. You will have your name written as a memorial, even on the mountain of God. What's he saying? God is saying to this eunuch. God is saying to the Gentile. God is saying to sinners everywhere, here and afar. He's telling them, come home. God says, I will break down anything that hinders you. So, I think he might have told them that he was cut off completely and Jesus had to be cut out and cut up so that 
he can cut in the grace deal. The grace deal. What's the grace deal? The grace deal is this. Let me get a cut on the grace deal. Cut me a grace deal. Give me grace. Give me mercy. Give me justice. Is what he's saying. All those without justice are now given justice. It's called justification. You know what that means, justification? Justification means just as you have never done it. You might have sinned, you might have fallen, you might have come short, but Jesus came, his blood, his body was torn, his, he went to the cross, he died for you, he prayed for you, he loves you, he purchased you back from your sinful life, and now he's given you a right way to live, an honorable way to live, a way of life, and now he looks at you, and God looks at you, and he sees the blood of Jesus, his son, on your life, it's washed away, it's been paid for, you are saved, you are are sanctified you are now being glorified from day to day by the renewing of your mind renewing of your spirit renewing of all that you are your nature your character it's changing you're leaving the world behind there is a metamorphosis that's taking place in your life you were a caterpillar but now you're becoming a butterfly why because God is changing you it's morphing you the spirit of God the word of God is changing you and now he's says no more judgment against you nothing but grace 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 church these are exciting words to encourage you you don't need to live like the world you don't need to act like the world you don't need to be cut off in the wilderness come into the promised land by the power of God check this out I believe God's plan for this eunuch is so important for those being cut off to see God's nature. What's God's nature? For God so loved the world. The in God. He loves the sinners. He loves those that were born into this world away from God, have no clue of who God is. They're lost and helpless and hopeless, but God still loves them. Last thing is this. His physical limitation gave him favor before God. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says God resists the proud in James 4, 6, but he gives grace to the humble. You know what it says? As this Ethiopian unit was reading, he says that, look, this person who's talking says he was cut off. He was humiliated. And know what he was doing? He was saying, the eunuch was saying this, I can identify with this Jesus. I can identify how, what it means to be relegated to the first place of worship. There are walls between me and the place, the innermost place. The, the holy of holies. But I've been cut off. And in me being cut off, I was humiliated. All these worshippers coming in their pious attitude and they look to that direction. There are the women and the Gentiles and there are the eunuchs. He was looked down on. And this eunuch says, I can identify with this person that was humiliated, that was falsely ju judged, that was falsely accused. I can identify with him. Can I tell you, in the world that we're living in, there's a lot of injustice. Just look at the news. Look at the news. Buildings are burning down. People are protesting in cities after cities. Policemen are being, in most cases, labeled by a few who are not righteous. And can I say to you, we need to pray for our leadership. You know what? Not only do we need to pray for our leadership, we as the church just need to wake up. We need revival. We need Holy Ghost revival in our cities. We need Holy Ghost revivals on our reservations. We need Holy Ghost revival in the homes where there is conflict and turmoil and hardship and difficulty. Let me tell you something. The only person that will bring complete justice is Jesus Christ. Jesus, 
because he was falsely accused and he did not retaliate. If we go after the nature of Jesus, you know what? Us being cut off, no power, no access, no voice, no justice, no, no nothing, while all of a sudden begin to line up for us. Because of the grace of God, look at this. God made provision for him to come in. Provision is always through God's word. We will understand and hear who we are. Not what the news says. Not what your social media says. Not how many people like you or dislike you. But you know what? The word of God is our authority. The word of God is a love letter from God to man who is lost and hopeless and helpless. And now what happens is God provides for us in that the heart of God is for us to be a fruitful tree. The riches of God is revealed in them. The grace of God is revealed in them. The nature of God is revealed in them. And people come from everywhere and they see Jesus in you. They take off a fruit and they eat it. And it tastes like patience. It tastes like gentleness. It tastes like love. It tastes like all the fruits of the Spirit. And people are blessed by it. The Nebuchadnezzar you see his physical limitation gave him favor before God God invitation into the temple and the walls and the name will be written as a memorial full access is given the blood of Jesus gives us full access Faith and obedience is the key. When you humble yourself, what happens? God will draw you near. God had someone to help him understand. Isaiah was one person to help him understand. Philip was another person that helped him understand. Check this out. You read the Bible, Paul. You read all the names and the people that wrote letters, John, James, Matthew, Mark, Luke. They help us understand God's word. It might be a spiritual parent, a spiritual parents, a mom and dad spiritually. Maybe it might be your biological mom that taught you. Your biological father, a grandma, a grandpa, somebody came alongside you and helped you grow in your faith. Evangelist, a prophet, a lay leader, a men's director, a woman's director. It might be a Sunday school teacher. It might be a children's church teacher. It might be God's going to send someone to help you. He had someone to come. Number two, under three. God had someone help him understand. This is called discipleship. I thank you, God, for others that speak into my life. This is the key in all of this. Be teachable. Be teachable. Don't be arrogant. Don't be puffed up. Don't be conceited. I know everything. You don't need to tell me anything. Right? That's what people say. I have more education. You know what? The edu- you can have 20 PhDs and you're still lost. You can never figure out all these things and the spiritual matters. Can I tell you? It's humility. It's being humble. It's being humble. Dean God Allah they need that we love God more than anything in this universe. So God has someone help him understand. Last thing is this God compels the eunuch into an everlasting relationship. He works on his heart, He does the heart surgery to this eunuch. He cuts out the stony heart. Jade saying it be dohata. 
God takes the heart of flesh, puts it in him. Tears probably runs down his cheeks for his sin and for all the atrocity he's ever done. And look what happens. He repents. He looks at Philip and says, Philip, look, there's water. My heart is now different. Now I'm sensitive to God. Okay, now, Philip, baptize me. Go ahead and baptize me. Get me under the water. And they stop the chariot. They get off the chariot. They go down into the water. And Philip takes this eunuch, this Ethiopian eunuch. He says most likely something to this effect. I now baptize you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Matthew 28, the Great Commission, by the pronouncement of your faith, Ethiopian eunuch, I'm sure he said his real name, and he dunked him, and by immersion, he didn't just sprinkle water on him, he just didn't social distance and put it in a spray bottle, and uh -uh. He, dunked, he dunked him under the water. What did Paul say about it in Romans 5 and 6? When we get dunked in the water, baptized, what do we do? We die with Jesus. Everything, all of it. We give it all up. And then when we come out of the water, what happens? We come up in the newness of life. Like Jesus came out of that tomb. Jesus just Hell, death, grave was defeated, rendered powerless. It was defamed. The sting was taken out. Have you ever taken a bee and took the stinger out and let that bee sting you? It can go like this with this body all day. It will not hurt you. Can I tell you something? Jesus rendered hell, death, the grave powerless of its potency to hurt and harm us. Now we have eternal life. The evidence is this. The Ethiopian unit was baptized. He comes out of the water. A new man. A new person. Can I encourage you? If you've not been baptized by water, if you number one, if you haven't professed Jesus as Lord and Savior, I wish you could do that today. I pray you will do that here in a bit. You get saved and then make your way to our church and we'll baptize you. We'll take you down to the lake and we'll dunk you. We'll find a swimming pool somewhere. We'll find something, a feeding trough. I can come to your house and dunk you in your horse corral where the feeding trough is. I can, we can dunk you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and let the dead man stay under the water and let the new man, the new woman, come out of that place. You see, spirit conviction was upon the eunuch and decided to be water baptized on the spot. He allowed God to work in his life and obedience was the result. A beautiful picture of the prodigal son coming home. God loves you and welcomes you home today. God is in the soul saving business. He, you know what? I know that COVID-19 shut down a lot of church buildings, but our church was never shut down. We keep preaching. We keep loving people. I've probably done more counseling in the last two, three weeks with people than ever before. Can I tell you today, God is still saving people from hell. God is still saving people from the world. God is still saving people from yourself. You shouldn't even trust yourself. You will self-destruct. We're good at that. We're good at sabotaging our future. We're good at hurting ourselves. We're good at just destroying our life. Leave it up to you. You will destroy it. That's why we need help. We need God. We need guidance. We need Holy Spirit conviction. You see, this eunuch was changed. They talk about it in church history that he went back to Ethiopia and so many people were ministered to through his life and his testimony. Oh, you didn't need the Ostland. Oh, you didn't need the Nayat Ehi Yutahaskai. 
This is the greatest message ever preached. The message of salvation. The message of hope. The message of Jesus Christ. And today, I want to invite you. If you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior today, my prayer for you is this. That you will not take a long time. You will not take a long time to run in your own way. That you will not take a long time and allow the enemy to hurt you. Allow sin to hurt you. Allow fear to control you. Allow darkness to overtake you. But you will give yourself to Jesus. Say, Lord Jesus, wash me and cleanse me. Lord Jesus, fill me with your spirit. Lord Jesus, show me who you are. Show me my downfall. Show me my sin. Show me my need for a savior to rescue me. Lord, today I come to you and I ask you to wash me through and through. I ask you that your precious blood would come and wash every part of my heart. Save my soul. Deliver me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen. You know, I gave my life to Jesus over 40 years ago. I was a young man at this that little tiny church. I came to the front. I prayed a simple prayer of faith. Gave my life to Jesus. And God has never failed me. God has never disappointed me. To this day, he's faithful. Every single moment. That's the God I serve. I serve a God of love. A God of compassion. A God of grace. A God that doesn't condemn. He convicts. He doesn't punish. He disciplines. He loves you. He cares for you. Why don't you give your life to Jesus? And today, if you did that, share it with us. Tell us. Let us know. If you need a Bible, we'll, give you, we'll get you a Bible. If you need to find a good church, wherever you are, we'll find you a good church. We'll try to do our best to walk with you. And this is what it's all about. The story of the Ethiopian eunuch. He was physically cut off, spiritually cut off, mentally cut off, emotionally cut off. He was cut off socially. But the cross brought him home. He's no longer cut off. His name is even greater than the sons and daughters that people say about others. God says you're even greater than that. I welcome you into my home. Praise God. With that, we want to say God bless you. Thank you for tuning in. We love you. We appreciate you. And please, let's continue to do our best. Let's continue to serve God. Let's continue to be faithful. Let's continue, and uh, there'll be more information coming forth in regards to Mount Top Church in our, for our in-body service starting next week. And again, we love all of you, and we want to serve you to the best of our ability. Please pray for Project Hope. We're going to be going out to the reservation again tomorrow, and uh, we'll be distributing probably uh, so much to the people up in the reservation. And if you have questions in regards to that, if you want to help us in that, uh, however way, uh, please let us know. Please reach out to us, and we'll do our best to connect with you. And those of you that have already given, there are churches that's been given. There are people that's been given. I mean, the other day, someone from Florida gave a considerable amount in the mail. They sent a check to us for Project Hope. I don't know how they heard about us, but I want to say thank you to you. God bless you a hundredfold. Amen. God bless you more than that. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your partnership. We love you. And may God receive glory and honor in all we do and all we are, even today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you.